This episode of New Politics was released on the 12th of March, 2022, and produced on the land of the Wangal people. This episode is dedicated to the memory of Senator Kimberly Kitching. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, the floods in New South Wales are becoming a political crisis for the Morrison government. Another day, another announcement, this time it's nuclear submarines. Peter Dutton in a bit of trouble. International Women's Day and all the big political issues of the week. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis. I am Groot. And a big thank you to our new Patreon subscribers. Thanks for signing up. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription. It's just $5 per month for the Ruby Standard Supporter level or $10 per month for the Gold Standard Supporter level. We also do have a new T-shirt design available. It's the It's Time for Change T-shirt. But whether it's a subscription or if you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a t-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. The floods are continuing to have a major impact on eastern Australia with the floods that started off in Queensland continuing through to northern New South Wales now hitting the streets of Sydney. And there is a belief that governments don't engage in any serious responses until it starts to affect a major city and forget about it when it's happening elsewhere. And that was certainly the case with the floods in Lismore, where the New South Wales and federal governments have been slow to act and provide support to people affected by this disaster. And we've pointed this out in our previous episodes. This is the reasons why governments exist. This is their time in the sun. And even when it would have been politically favourable for the New South Wales and federal governments to act swiftly, they've ignored their responsibilities, they seem to be confused about what to do, and ultimately they've left some very angry communities behind. It's neighbour helping neighbour. It's We've got strangers turning up with hot food, tea, biscuits, cakes. We don't know who these people are. Where's the army? Why isn't the government taking responsibility? We're now seeing the direct costs of decades of inaction on climate change. There's been so many authoritative reports published over the past 20 years suggesting that there are many areas of Australia that will become uninhabitable because of extreme flooding and weather events. And we had the major bushfire events from two years ago. The government has done nothing since that time. And with these major floodings, they're making the same mistakes. What will it take for a government to start listening and start taking action on these issues? New South Wales and the federal government are both governments that believe that government shouldn't exist. And that's the ultimate. They want smaller government. There was that bizarre YouTube clip from Barnaby Joyce a couple of years back where he says, I want the government out of my life. I'm sick of it. And of course, the answer to that is it's very easy to get the government out of your life, Barnaby. Resign your seat, although indications are that he's going to have his seat resigned for him. Both governments seem to be in to protect the interests of the very wealthy and not much more. Of course, they want government in your life when it comes to women's health issues, when it comes to marriage rights, when it comes to LGBTQIA plus rights. They want the government there altogether. Uh, But when it comes to them being able to pillage public funds, to give public funds to friends, for corporations to do the wrong thing to make money, they want the government out of their life. And I think this is why the people of Lismore, the people of South Queensland have been neglected. They don't do anything because they don't think they should do anything. And they don't have the courage to state this. Shane Stone, the head of the emergency, basically said those people shouldn't live there. Now, the whole idea of where to build and where to live and what is a floodplain and what isn't is a discussion that should be held constantly. But it's one of those things that shouldn't be held during a flood. 
And one other aspect that I've noticed over the past, well, it's probably for the entire duration of this Morrison government, but marketing and advertising has taken a more prominent feature within politics. And I'm not saying anything new here, but I'm not talking about just in election campaigns and campaigning processes, but the action of governing as well. And that's led to a change in the political dynamics. And many people have said to us, well, why doesn't the government just step in and do the work that's expected of them? This is a crisis. That's what governments are for. And some people might think that my answer is a little bit too cynical about in this issue, but the floods up in northern New South Wales are happening in seats at the state and federal levels that vote for the Labor Party. And It's an extension of that corporatist approach to government. Well, you didn't vote for us, so you're not going to get any support. And this is an approach that's been adopted by conservative governments all around the world, and especially the conservative government in Britain, where it's like the electorate is voting for a brand or a political company. And if your electorate doesn't vote for the government party, well, you don't get anything. Now, it's always been a little bit like this, where the government of the day will service the seats that they do hold because they want to make sure that they don't lose them at the next election, but this is taking it to the next level. We saw it with the sports rort several years ago, where 70% of funding went to coalition-held seats. We saw the same with the car park funding scandal as well. So instead of just actively supporting those seats that they do hold, the Liberal National Coalition actively punishes those seats that it doesn't hold. And it's it's a little bit like mobile phone companies. Telstra is not going to fix up your phone if you're an Optus customer. And the Coalition is not going to fix your problem if you're not considered to be someone from one of their client electorates. And they don't seem to think that there's a problem with all of this. It's disgraceful politics, of course. Once you're in office, and many prime ministers stated this, including prime ministers we don't like. Now, they said it. They might not have fully meant it, but they mostly meant it. They meant it at least 75% of the time. Once you're in office, you're governing for all Australians. Once you're there, it doesn't matter if you are the most diametrically opposed person who would never vote for the government. The government is there to serve you as much as everyone else. Now, sometimes decisions are made which favour those that voted for them as opposed that those aren't. But most often, the role of government should be to benefit as many people. Are you embarrassed that ordinary Australians are having to do so much work in this? Ordinary Australians are having to get themselves to remote areas in their dinghies, wading through floodwaters to help people to take them food and to make sure they're all right. No, Koshi, I mean, that's the Australian spirit. Uh, that's what you and I would do for our neighbours. Absolutely. It's what and people do we in We want extremis. the ADF to do that for so, us no, as well. No, I'm not, embarrassed by, I'm not embarrassed by that. And the ADF is doing it. And I'm just not going to cop criticism of, of the ADF. The Australian Defence Force, they've actually received quite a lot of criticism for not acting quickly enough in the northern New South Wales floods. And the Minister for Defence, Peter Dutton, he's been doing quite a bit of sympathy trialling where he keeps saying that he's not going to let people question the bravery of the Australian Defence Force. Now, no one's actually doing that. They're questioning Peter Dutton's performance and the performance of the federal government in their response. But the ADF, I've got to say, when they did actually arrive in Lismore, they seemed to be more concerned about video recording what they were doing and doing a few photo shoots for Instagram. They're filming themselves. Look at them, emptying out a trailer full of rubbish onto the side of the road with the rubbish. This is what's happening. They're filming themselves. Look at them. This is unbelievable. Doing a good job, guys. That trailer ain't going to empty itself, is it? Make sure you get it filmed. This is incredible. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well done, fellas. You're earning every penny. Look at that trailer. Save the trailers, everybody. And it also seems that the government is starting to lose the crowd and their usual supporters within the media are starting to call them out over their mishandling of the floods. Speaking to Kevin Hogan just before this, or this is a one in 3,500 year event, a one in 3,500 year event for his area in Lismore. So it is is beyond something that is naturally able to be planned for. This is um, monumentous, it's diluvian. Barnaby, this whole one in, 100, one in, 1,000, one in, 3,000 sounds 
to most people to be BS, to be yep. quite frank. We've heard uh, the Bureau of Meteorology mm -hmm. say that's not right. Uh, and we've heard the, uh, a minister in New South Wales, the Minister for Western Sydney, saying it's actually a 1% chance of it happening every year. So we've had it last year and we've had it this year and yep. it could happen again, uh, again next year. So I think we need to drop all that stuff, don't we? It, it can happen, so what well, do we do uh, about it? Well, I'm, I'm either going to... I'm either going to listen to the member for Western Sydney or listen to the local member, Kevin Hogan, okay. who actually lives there. And I'm going or the to Bureau be of Meteorology. To Kevin Hogan. We don't want to argue about it, but we just have to... I well, mean, get, them, get, the, get, the, get, get them to talk to them. Get them to talk to them. And, so, and if, they, if they've got another reason where they say that something is 2.1 metres higher than the okay. last record, the biggest record known in history, then they can explain that to you on television. Okay. Because so, I don't know what the, the answer to that one is. Yeah, we went to the experts for the answer rather than a politician... Many people are getting very frustrated with the lack of action from the government on these floods and it seems like the lack of action on climate change management over the many years is beginning to catch up politically with this government. I think uh, it's fair to say that David Koch is not a terribly radical or even hugely progressive figure and that if we were to examine everything he said, he would be a at least nominal supporter of the current government, or at least of a liberal government. I don't think I'm insulting him to say that. I hope I'm not. But he's a finance journalist with a lot of interest in business, etc., etc. So, so it makes sense. He's definitely not a leftist revolutionary. No, definitely not. <laughs> so when he's getting stuck into the government, and even if it's performative, even if it's a way for Channel 7, who is definitely pro-government, by the way, to try and tap into the mood of its viewers and try and diffuse that mood by saying, oh, Koshi said it, we can calm down and, and then vote for them. It's still, I think, a rather desperate way to go. It wasn't surprising as such because he's done it before, but it was, it was quite freeing, really, to see that even Channel 7 and even David Koch could see that things had gone horribly wrong and were willing to point it out, even if the motivations and... And I'll be fair, I, I suspect that at least 90% of his motivations were anger and frustration, uh, even if some of it was that performative aspect before. I think it did come from a very, a, a fairly genuine place. So for this part of the media to start really getting stuck into government, and the other thing the morning show tries to be is rather apolitical. It tries to do its politics more insidiously than that. So it was a fairly remarkable moment in a big year that's been full of remarkable moments. And we are going to keep saying this until we go blue in the face, but the main role of government should have been to reduce the risks from climate change and adapt to new climate change situations. And some of the government are now suggesting that maybe some of these locations shouldn't be rebuilt. Well, maybe if they had some clear thinking behind it instead of the usual politicking that's been going on with climate change over the past two decades, there could have been some creative relocation solutions implemented before this time, but it's all a little bit too late now. There have been many high-level reports produced over the past 30 years indicating that many parts of Australia might become uninhabitable because of climate change through floods, fires and higher temperatures. And it's been over 50 years since the first major international research on the effects of climate change was first published. So all of this information is not new, but there's just been so much political grandstanding and misinformation on this, not just in Australia, but in many parts of the world. But the bigger issue is that the community and the environment is the one that's going to pay for all of this and not the political leaders who have been making those bad decisions over many years now. And and we can never be sure if a different government such as the Labor government could have made a difference during this time. And we'll never know until the next time there's a flood of this nature and there's a Labor government in office and you know, then we can go back and compare the notes. But your starting point has to be that this is the role of government to act preemptively so that when the crisis does arrive, the impact is lessened. But at the moment, the floods are becoming symbolic of a federal government being overtaken by events that it can't control, either politically or practically. And and for sure, the floodwaters will recede at some point. But so are the chances of this federal government winning at the next federal election. If they were hoping that people would forget the bushfire debacle of 2019. And, of course, he goes on 60 Minutes and he 
exactly reminds people in a way of trying to deflect it by playing the ukulele, by having uh, Mrs. Morrison take responsibility for it, by sitting in a relaxed holiday atmosphere with uh, Karl Stefanovic. If they were thinking that that might have been neutralised or forgotten about, and they were thinking that his treatment of the rape victims were forgotten, so thinking about the appalling management of the pandemic might be forgotten because it's finally starting to slow down and they were banking on the short memories of the electorate. And this close to an election that they have to have. And I don't think it absolutely impossible that he'll try and call the half Senate election and then a half House of Reps election. I don't think it's very likely. I think it's a one in 50,000 chance. But desperate people do desperate things, particularly when they're desperate for wrong reasons. He's been caught out, or the government has been caught out again and again and again and again and again. And this close to an election, he's really lost Queensland and he's really lost New South Wales. And that's nearly half the seats. There's 10 seats in South Australia, five seats in Tasmania. There's 15 seats or something in in Western Australia. And as far as I can tell, there's no more loathed politician in Western Australia than Scott Morrison, unless you include Clive Palmer in that. All they needed to do was put in an appropriate response, and they just might have neutralised some of the bad feeling from before. But they haven't. And I think memories are long when it comes to this stuff. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Up next, it's a new day, and there's yet another announcement, with the Prime Minister announcing a nuclear submarine base. Speaking of desperation, the Prime Minister has made an announcement that he intends to build a nuclear submarine base on the east coast of Australia. And the caveat that we always have to provide here is that this is just an announcement. And based on what we know, and with all things that Scott Morrison announces, it's unlikely to ever happen. And these are the issues that we have to take into account. This is part of the AUKUS arrangement that was made late last year in the wake of the cancellation of the submarines project with the French government. The nuclear-powered submarines, and that's if they're ever actually produced, they are due to arrive in 2040. And one of the locations that Morrison has suggested, Brisbane, it doesn't have the right maritime conditions to house nuclear-powered submarines. Brisbane and two other suggested locations, Newcastle and Wollongong, they're not even in the top five list of locations suggested by the Australian Department of Defence. And this is all purely a political announcement. By not defining the location, he's giving the appearance of some kind of facility coming to those locations. But equally, those three locations will be equally disappointed when they realise after the election that it was all never going to happen anyway. The US President George Bush, he had that famous declaration in 2002 when he claimed that Iran, North Korea and Iraq formed the axis of evil. And now Scott Morrison has made this announcement under the banner of the Ark of Autocracy. Now, I don't even know what the Ark of Autocracy actually means. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it doesn't have the same ring as the force of axis of evil, does it, David? No, not at all. 
just getting back to there's been a bit of criticism too in that any place where there's a nuclear base nuclear submarine base becomes a nuclear target and the mayor of brisbane and i think the mayor of newcastle in new south wales which was the other place that was mentioned have both said "Mm, we don't really want a nuclear sub base here because we don't want to be nuclear targets and newcastle is only two hours from sydney brisbane is only 10 hours from sydney which in a war isn't that long let alone canberra Uh, i did like the the wag who said the best place would be darwin Mm, why can't we use the port there (laughs) well there's so many issues that need to be taken into account with submarines it's not like you go to the submarine shop and say well i'll have six of those and two of those and two more of those and throw in another one for free then it gets delivered in a couple of weeks with the keys and a box of chocolates there's a long waiting list the construction of these won't commence until 2030 that's eight years away and all of this is theoretical it's hyper theoretical we don't know what type of submarines are going to be built all we've heard is that they'll be nuclear we don't know the costs or the conditions we don't know whether they'll actually be needed or not and These are massive submarines, and they might be redundant in 20 years' time. Submarine warfare is moving more towards clustering and smaller drone-like underwater vessels, so Australia might be stuck with a few underwater white elephants. Here's what Greg Sheridan had to say about it. Talk is cheap. Actions count. And what did the Prime Minister announce? He announced that a defence committee will look at a location for a base to take a shape over the next 20 years, so the $10 billion for the base is to cover the next 20 years, for subs which don't exist, we haven't ordered, and God knows when we'll ever get. There, There is no way on God's green earth we'll get this fleet of nuclear subs in under 25 years. If we can spend $70 million on missiles for Ukraine, how about a couple of billion dollars for long-range ground-based missiles for Australia, instead of which the Army is buying tanks and heavy armour we can never use. The nuclear subs, they exist in science fiction time. This is a kind of a Star Trek capability. Now, even allowing that all these things in some bizarre alternate universe make sense, why isn't the government giving us some extra capability in the next five to ten years? And the answer is it's doing absolutely nothing. Now, I'm no natural enemy of the Morrison government, but I am just flabbergasted that in this big national security speech and in the hundreds of billions of dollars that Josh Frydenberg has flushed down the toilet with COVID, we've got not one new missile, not one new warship, nothing. I I just can't believe it, Andrew. Perhaps I'm strange, but it just strikes me as unbelievable. So Greg Sheridan is not a happy man. And on top of this, there's no nuclear industry in Australia. So you'd have to create that from scratch to service these vehicles. And sure, that takes time. But to start developing something to service something that might happen or might not happen in 20 years time just seems to be quite foolish. And it's not even clear if there's a political benefit to this. It just seems like an announcement for the sake of making the announcement. I'm wondering if they know that they're going to lose the next election. And so they're doing stuff that might save them some seats, but stuff that they won't actually have to be bound to. Of course, if they pull a miracle out of the hat like they did last time, and that's still a potentiality, by the way, will it be like the religious discrimination bills, federal ICAC bill, which just go nowhere? It's one thing to say you're going to do something. It's another thing to actually do it. Well, the Australian Defence Force, they did produce a report suggesting that the best locations to house nuclear submarines in Australia, if it did ever come to this, but the three locations suggested by Scott Morrison, Brisbane, Newcastle, Wollongong, they're not even in the top five recommendations. The top three locations, according to the ADF, are Sydney Harbour, and that, of course, is never going to happen because of political and strategic reasons, and two locations in Jarvis Bay. Jarvis Bay already has a military presence and is one of the best harbours in the world for submarines, but it's so typical for this Morrison government to not seek the best outcome and the best solution, but the best political benefit for himself and the Liberal National Coalition. The Liberal and National Coalition, they have to try and hold on to seats in Queensland and in the Hunter region, as well as trying to win the seats of Gilmore and Eden Monero, and that's the reason why these announcements are being made. It's all about politics and nothing about reality. But essentially, we've mentioned quite a few times during this segment, this is unlikely to happen. But 
Some marine announcements are becoming a little bit like announcements on new train lines or the second airport in Sydney. And since 1947, every single election campaign has had an announcement on the second Sydney airport, and it took over seven years before they started working on that. And it's not really a federal election campaign unless someone announces a train line somewhere between Melbourne and Brisbane, and only to find out that it never happens after the election. And perhaps the submarine's announcement is going to be the same. An announcement right now, but no action at all after the election. I still doubt that the second airport is going to happen. I know that they've started work on it. And by started work on it, they bought the land at a vastly inflated rate off a liberal donor. They're not strong financial managers. They're not good in crises. They couldn't even protect their own interests with the religious discrimination bill. And it's almost as if the last bastion is we are good on defence, which they're not. If you look at it, Labor wins World War I, Labor wins World War II, Labor pulls us out of Vietnam. Liberals don't do so well in wartime. I will be very fair here. It's easy to sit here 100 years and 70 years and all of that down the track and say that's what we would have done. But nonetheless, Labor has the better record. Curtin still regarded as the best Prime Minister by a lot of analysts. Whitlam uh, is the one who pulls the pin on Vietnam. Now, I know that the Liberal Party had started, but Whitlam just draws a line under it and finishes it. Labor tend to be better military managers too. And you'd think that a major announcement on submarines would involve the Minister for Defence, but it looks like he's got himself busy with a few other matters. There's also been a wide range of allegations made against Peter Dutton and his connections with Brisbane-based companies SCD, Remanufactured Vehicles and Boss Holding Capital. And both of these companies make significant donations to the Liberal National Party. These allegations were reported by Jordan Shanks. He's also known as Friendly Geordies. And these are some of the issues that we've reported on in the past as well. Peter Dutton actually appeared in an SCD advertisement in the lead up to the 2019 federal election. And there's also that relationship between Peter Dutton and Paladin Company, which seems to have been funneling a lot of money from the federal government for that job of managing asylum seekers on Manus Island. So we might be getting some ideas about why the ADF has been slow to act in the Lismore floods and why Dutton hasn't been involved in any of the announcements on the submarines. He's been making himself very, very friendly with a few companies that are donating government funds directly back into the Liberal National Party. Dutton is hugely litigious. So you're suggesting that we have to be very careful about what we say here? Well, yeah, in general, yes. <laughs> but we always are. We only ever work on fact and reason supposition. It's interesting that he hasn't yet sued Jordan Shanks, and he might be very wary of how well it went when John Barillaro, leader of the New South Wales Nationals, tried to sue Jordan Shanks. I think they had to change one sentence or something, and otherwise Barillaro, he resigned with some very interesting timing. And suddenly he wasn't John Barillaro, leader of the National Party in New South Wales. He was John Barillaro, private citizen. And legal people told me that totally changed his case and made it almost irrelevant. And of course, we have the Christian Porter cases and out of politics, the Ben Robert Smith case. So weaponizing defamation can go horribly wrong Dutton was unusual in that he has won a defamation case, but he hasn't made any comment on the Jordan Shanks video. Partly that's because he hasn't been asked to make public comment. And of course, if he wants to come on here and make a public comment about it, he is more than welcome. There's a sense in which I looked at it and I watched the, the video with great interest and, and great amusement. Jordan's a pretty funny guy. There's a sense in which he could probably plausibly deny much. Yes, look, I'm a local member. I'm a cabinet minister. I know lots of people. I know that they were donors and a donor asked me to go into an advertisement. Nobody else would refuse that. I have very little to do with the nefarious stuff they do, except that it seems that the money flows both ways and that changes things. So it will be interesting to see how this pans out. 
The allegations also involved Ryan Shaw, who was also employed by SCD and was the Liberal national candidate in the Queensland seat of Lilly. And there have been allegations of widespread cocaine usage within the company and sex parties in the style of Eyes Wide Shut. Now, there's nothing illegal about having sex parties amongst politicians, and it seems to be a bit of a thing for conservative parties. And we also have to remember the prayer room at Parliament House being used for all sorts of sexual activity by conservative staffers and MPs. But the cocaine usage, that's another issue. And there were photographs of Ryan Shaw snorting what seemed to be a white powder. Now, you'd have to think, what type of company does Peter Dutton keep? What are the links between all of these different companies that have big contracts with the Department of Defence and then the money flows back into the Liberal National Party through donations. This is all very much like the corruption of the Joe Bielke peterson era in the 1970s and the 1980s. It's all very much on public display, but nobody wants to do anything about it. And it seems like all of this would be a very interesting case for a federal commission against corruption to explore. If only we had one, David. Well, they promised it. They've still got a couple of weeks. Maybe they can set it up then. It's clear why they don't want one. Again, Peter Dutton may well have done nothing wrong, but the company you keep is very interesting. And we've examined this before on the podcast. Politicians have had their careers ended through associations that they weren't even aware were bad associations. So Dutton had apparently, there were rumours around, which I think most of our listeners would be aware of, that he was trying to unseat Scott Morrison before the election. I'm not sure how true that was, but certainly if he had aspirations to be Prime Minister, given these allegations, given his poor performance managing the floods, those aspirations have been delayed by at least a decade, if not finished altogether. And if he loses the seat of Dixon, which is a likelihood, the Labour member there, Ali France, is apparently doing an extremely good job Uh, And she came quite close last time. If he loses the next election, he's finished in politics. Of course, he's got his apparent vast wealth to live off plus parliamentary pension, so he'll be okay. But it's more along the lines of he has probably overplayed his hand. He's been caught out on things that aren't terribly good to be caught out on, including the floods, and then trying to deflect that criticism to the army than to defend the army. Nobody thinks that the army isn't brave. Nobody thinks that the army doesn't do a great job in this type of stuff, or at least nobody in the mainstream thinks this. He was supposed to send 5,000 troops up. I've heard numbers from 498 to about 700, nowhere near 5,000. I think his career as a politician has ended. I think we also have to look at the role of the media in all of this as well. When the allegations were made by Jordan Shanks last week, Ryan Shaw resigned as the Liberal National Party candidate and the media cited that he resigned because of mental health issues and PTSD from the time that he worked as a sniper in the Australian Defence Force and that was it. That was the end of it. And something like this should be a goldmine for the mainstream media outlets. There's sex, there's drugs, doesn't seem to be any rock and roll at the moment, but there's also corruption. But the media was completely silent about it. There was no comment about it from Peter Dutton, nothing to say about the bravery of the ADF in this case, and there was no comment at all from the Australian Federal Police or the ADF. And Jordan Shanks, he does have an influence in Australia. He's got something like 613,000 subscribers on YouTube, and essentially he hasn't got the power and influence of the Australian mainstream media. And he's part of a shoebox outfit with a team of four. No offence there, Jordan. But this is the material that he's been able to dig up and find. But the mainstream media, with their thousands of reporters, Walkley Award-winning investigative journalists, all they seem to be able to find on this issue is a whole lot of silence. Yeah, it's like they're scared of him. It's like that the the interests are too closely aligned. In fact, it's not like it. We know that their interests are too closely aligned. I think, too, the fact that Peter Dutton will sue and has been successful in this doesn't help. And, of course, if he is innocent, we're happy to say that. And we've really made very few allegations beyond what Jordan made. We're just reporting Jordan's allegations. He's in a spot where, as a politician, he's in a very dangerous place and a place where I don't think he can get out of. 
You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. It was also International Women's Day during the week and it's a global day to commemorate the cultural, political and socio-economic achievements of women and work towards gender equality and eradicate violence and abuse against women. Here's what Scott Morrison had to say about gender equity on International Women's Day in 2019. See, we're not about setting Australians against each other, trying to push some down to lift others up. That's not in our values. That is an absolutely liberal value, that you don't push some people down to lift some people up. And that is true about gender equality too. We want to see women rise. But we don't want to see women rise only on the basis of others doing worse. And here's what he had to say on International Women's Day in 2021. Today, here and in many cities across our country, women and men are gathering together in rallies both large and small, to call for change and to act against violence directed towards women. It is good and right, Mr Speaker, that so many are able to gather here in this way, whether in our capital or elsewhere, and to do so peacefully to express their concerns and their very genuine and real frustrations. This is a vibrant liberal democracy, Mr Speaker. Not far from here, such marches, even now, are being met with bullets. But not here in this country, Mr Speaker. Not here in this country. And in 2022, he didn't say anything at all. There was no public comment, no message on any of his social media channels. Maybe he's been too busy making announcements on some marine bases that will never be built. But based on past performances, it was probably best for him to keep quiet. There's... Still many gender-based issues within the Liberal and National parties, and they're just hoping that all of this will go away, but they're not going to go away for a long, long time. Only 21% of Coalition MPs are women, compared to 47% Labor MPs, and that's unlikely to change very much after the next election. And it seems like it's yet another issue the Coalition doesn't want to talk about, because it will just remind the electorate about all of their failings within this particular issue. I think, too, that most of the women, as in more than half, in the coalition side are National Party members. I think that needs to be acknowledged, that the National Party are doing a little bit better than the the Liberal Party in this stuff. But you're right, the times have changed. I think where the compromise will land is it will stop getting incompetent men being promoted. (laughs) Amanda Vanstone, of all people, said on that show about women in the federal parliament that she'd know when women's equality had been achieved when you'd have an incompetent woman get promoted. I think there was a moment of collective silence around Australia when she said that. She's not wrong, of course, but we may have already reached that moment looking at the career of Amanda Vanstone. Having said that, the time has changed. The women have have shown themselves to be much more than capable over the last hundred years. But the market, society, culture is starting to reflect that in a major way. This is one of the reasons why the current Australian government is essentially going the way of the dinosaur. I think we're going to say better candidates come through from the Liberal Party over the next couple of election cycles as they realise how duddy and how poor a lot of their candidates have been. And Labor and the Greens, let's be fair too, have been a a, a little bit ahead. Not as far ahead as they should be, but certainly ahead of where other things are. And I think this is for the best. 
And speaking of Amanda Vanstone, there's a little bit of surprising news coming in from South Australia, and that's the likelihood of a one-term state government. It doesn't happen that often, but it did happen in Victoria in 2014 after Labor defeated the Bailu Napthine government, and then again in 2015 in Queensland when the Newman government was defeated by Anastasia Palaszczuk, as well as Campbell Newman losing his seat. And Stephen Marshall has got a good chance of losing both the government and his seat as well. Their state election is on next Saturday and opinion polls are suggesting a 5% swing against the government. They've had quite a few corruption issues to deal with. They're actually governing in minority. They're fighting amongst themselves. So it's not just happening in New South Wales. It's happening within the South Australia Liberal Party as well. So it's not actually a very good look for the Liberal Party at the moment in South Australia. No, it's not. Marshall had been beset by some bad luck, but in politics, often bad luck is of your own making. And that's true of Rudd and Gillard federally. Uh, They had some bad luck, but it was to do with how the party was managed, who got through, who had to be promoted. And I think Marshall had a bit of this as well, that there's bad luck that maybe could have been avoided. I think there's a general turn against liberal governments coming through, given that McGowan in Western Australia, Palaszczuk in Queensland were able to win third and fourth terms with increased majorities, says a lot. And this underlines what we've been saying consistently for some time, that there was this view forming that the coronavirus and other external issues, they were assisting incumbent governments with their re-election chances and all they had to do was pretty much turn up on election day and it was all over and done with. But It's the same old issue that comes into play, and this is the issue that's going to appear at the South Australia election next weekend. It's competence and unity. If your government is competent, they'll be re-elected. If your government is no good, then there's no amount of coronavirus or external events that can save it. It's going to be thrown out of office. And we're also seeing a pattern of electoral behaviour, not just in Australia, you referred to this before, but it's happening all around the world. During a time when the community is seeing the need for more government support, not less, they're voting in these governments that are promising that type of support. And we've seen centrist and centre-left governments that are being voted in. And if Labor wins the South Australia election next weekend, that will be a continuation of that pattern. Marshall government did handle the pandemic fairly well. They closed borders. They stared down the federal government, the federal liberals. They kept numbers down for as long as they could. That is actually in their favour. But I think the other issues might just be against them. We still also have the president of New South Wales who Gladys Berejiklian had 10 members on the crossbench who'd resigned from the Liberal Party over allegations of corruption and inappropriate behaviour. And they still won the next election. So Marshall might just get over the line there. Although whether his leadership survives, that's a whole other thing again. And there's also that other election coming up, which is yet to be called, and that's the federal election due to be held before the 21st of May this year. All the recent polls are just confirming what the preceding opinion polls have been reporting, so there's no real change there. But there was an essential poll released this week, and one component in there suggests that there is a move for change. And that's one issue that you mentioned several weeks ago, David, but Almost 50% of the electorate is suggesting that it's time to give someone else a go, and only 32% are saying that the government deserves to be re-elected. And those numbers were almost even back in August 2021, which is what you'd normally expect at any given time. But just a couple of months before the election, if you've got almost half of the electorate suggesting that it's time for someone else to have a go, it's going to be very hard for the government to change those perceptions. Governments can go from being hideously unpopular to being popular. Howard knew how to massage the election cycle to get re-elected. So did Hawke, really. Hawke was never quite as unpopular as John Howard was. But if you look at polls taken in the middle of his terms as opposed to polls taken closer to the end, there was always a, a few points difference. That's partly the natural life of a government. And of course, it's also good government management. You put all your unpopular decisions in the beginning and near the middle and save the good stuff till the end so that when it comes through, people tend to remember the good stuff. Oh, this happened. Oh, well, they did that. But then again, they balanced that out by doing this. I'll vote for them again. Okay. that's And that's how you get four and five terms, usually. 
the current government has had way too much go wrong, some of it out of its control, of course. Not many people were expecting a pandemic. Floods and bushfires weren't caused by the government, but it's all in the management of this stuff. And they've mismanaged. There's no way around it. Well, all of those factors involved in turning around a particular election result. Scott Morrison did have the political skill to turn things around back in 2019. John Howard, as you alluded to before, managed to do that in 2004, 2001, 1998. Bob Hawke did it quite a few times. Paul Keating managed to do it back in 1993. So things can be turned around quite quickly if necessary, but you do need that political skill to achieve that. And who knows, Scott Morrison might actually have that political skill to turn things around within a two-month period. But we can see what Scott Morrison is trying to do between now and the next election, which As I mentioned before, it's got to be held before the 21st of May and it's got to be announced by the 18th of April, which is just a month away. And it's a little bit like throwing the dice around to see where it lands and hoping that the right numbers come up. But these numbers are just not appearing for him. The submarine space announcement was all about that. Make the announcement and see what the reaction is within the media and the public. Research is also suggesting that the electorate doesn't see any difference between Labor or the coalition in the handling of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And we actually copped a little bit of flack for suggesting that the Ukraine crisis wouldn't really resonate with the Australian public. And we think that it's a major international issue and call on Vladimir Putin to cease and desist. Not that he's going to listen to us, but ultimately we just don't think that it's going to be an issue that will sway too many votes in Mm. Australia. And that's not to say that we're not troubled by what's happening in the Ukraine, but it's not really a vote changer here. But We can now see what Morrison is trying to do. He's trying to loop something like a submarine base into a national security issue that's somehow related to a conflict in Ukraine. He'll gamble, realise that that doesn't work, and then he'll move on to something else. But you can't juggle all of these balls in the air and hoping that they'll all hold. Something at some point has to give, and you can distract people from the main game momentarily, but people are now focused on the floods and the weather events here, and it seems like the floods might actually be the final straw for the electorate. Yeah, I I think so. And yes, uh, Ukraine is important and it's a horrible thing that's happening and we acknowledge that. But I agree, Australians aren't going to vote on the Prime Minister's response to it, which is why I think he shut up about it too. Although apparently he shut up about a lot of things. He's in Lismore at the moment and no one's allowed to film, which suggests a whole lot of things. A man who is addicted to the camera is not allowing media to film him visiting a disaster area. I don't think he actually has the political skills. I think he was able to con people into thinking he has political skills. I think he's a bully and I think that he had the ability to make people think he was a very nuanced, skillful operator, but I don't think he is. I think that he's immature He's reactive, he's impulsive, he's a short-term thinker. As he admitted himself, he's transactional. It's never about the public good. It's never about improving things. It's about what can he get out of this? What does he have to trade to be able to get an advantage he's after? And I think people are starting to see this in in a major way. The soft pieces for commercial networks didn't work. He won't go on the ABC at all, and he's now stopping the office of the Prime Minister showing compassion and concern in a disaster area. These are the actions of desperation. These are the action of a person who is behind and and I don't think knows how to get in front. Again, I'm not saying that they will definitely lose the election, but on the balance of probabilities, I suspect that they're not going to win. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. If you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.